so first of all, uh, thank you very much for organizing this event and uh, together with this workshop. And thank you very much for the invitation. And this talk is about causal representation learning from unknown interventions. Actually, this title is not really precise. I use the interventions uh, in a kind of very, very blood way uh, because I would like to draw the connection between this talk and the theme of the workshop. Essentially, a better way to use this title. So color, uh, color representation from changes. So why? Because essentially, if you know how interventions were applied, essentially you can find a color model because um, if you define causality based on interventions, uh, this definitely is somehow, somehow um, circular. As a consequence, if you can really identify interventions and very often time you can immediately see the color relations. Now, we can see how we can do color discovery and color representation learning from only changes. Okay, so uh, before talking about the, the possible ways to uh, learn color representation from observational data, um, based, but let me say something about this talk. This talk is essentially a summary of a number of concrete works on how to learn uh, color model and color representation from data. In uh, uh, this summary is clearly not complete, so I apologize for that. Uh, so some important work might be overlooked. And uh, furthermore, compare, compared to Frederick's work uh, presentation, this presentation would be dry because it's a summary. I would like to consider all possible situations and then we can see uh, what kind of, with assumption we have to make use of and what information of the color model or the color representation can be recovered. And if you have any questions, please just interrupt me. Okay, so before we talk about method or settings, let's have a look at the classical modularity property of a color system. Essentially, when we say uh, right here, this is a color system. Essentially, here with the color uh, system, we know that we have a modular way to think of the relationships among those variables. In this example, we know that oh, we have three processes to generate Z, X, and Y respectively, and those processes are not, are not related, right? They are not relevant. And this kind of uh, modularity property actually implies a lot of statistical uh, conditions that can be discovered from data, uh, that can be reflected in the data. So here, by, uh, by, by, by making use of the modularity property, we know that the changes in the color model or following the color model would be, first of all, minimal uh, because you cannot reduce the change in different modules, right, to a smaller number of modules. And second of all, those changes are independent, right, because those changes are not related to each other. And then if you observe multiple realizations of some underlying quantity, uh, say a distribution, then those changes would be statistically independent. Yeah, uh, so now let's see how we can make use of the independent the property the property of independent and the minimal changes of a causal system or uh, to recover the property of the causal system by analyzing data. Here by changes, I mean two kinds of changes. We may have changes in the values of the measured variables, and sometimes we can have changes in the hidden variables or the hidden parameters in the system. But in any case, we have the property of minimal and independent changes. And here, by a minimal change, I mean the following thing. A minimal change representation explains the conditional independent relations uh, in the variables and the distribution change or all the distribution across different domains with a minimal number of change conditional distributions. Clearly, the two online color processes satisfy the minimal change property, right? And now the, property, the problem is how we can recover the underlying color representation. This is a clear inverse problem, right? In order to recover truth, we have to establish the identifiability result. So this talk will be uh, many folks on the identifiability result. You can see in different scenarios, how we can show that the underlying model or the underlying representation is actually uh, identifiable from the data. Let's here consider uh, all possible combinations. Essentially, we consider three dimensions. The first dimension is whether the data is ID. The second dimension is whether we can benefit from parametric constraints on the color influence or the color model. And the third one is whether there are latent confounders in the underlying color model. So we have three dimensions. Now let's consider different uh, combinations. 
Let's start with a classical color discovery uh, result. So we are considering ID data without parametric constraints on the color inference. And uh, we can, first of all, let's suppose that there are no latent confounder in the system. Then we know that with the, with the condition in time, uh, with the condition in time based method or confirm based method, we can recover the mark of internal class with PC or some other method. And even if we allow confounders in the underlying code process, we can still recover some equipment class, right? Although in many cases, uh, such results are, may not be informative enough because generally speaking, their results are not unique. However, you can see in this uh, very basic situation, we can still say something about the underlying, uh, underlying code relations. A typical assumption underlying those methods, including PC and FCI, uh, is edge minimality, is faithfulness. And faithfulness, essentially implies the edge minimality. Uh, and we can consider each edge is as one way to change the conditional distribution of the target variable given other causes. In other words, edge minimality can also be considered as one particular instantiation of the minimal changing principle. So we would like to have a minimal, minimum number of ways to change the conditional distribution to produce the data, uh, the data dependence. Now let's go further. So, Let's see how we can benefit from parametric constraints. Right here, you can see uh, three typical constraints on the functional color model so that we can identify color direction without making use of temporal information. So here you can see a linear non-Gaussian model, a personal linear color model, and an additive knowledge model. Basically, here we benefit from a property of independent changes. Only in the right color direction, under the assumption uh, uh, on the causal influence, then only the right direction can give rise to independent changes between the noise term and the hypothetical cause. And in the wrong direction, we can show that uh, the change cannot be, cannot be independent. So here we have identifiability. We benefit from independent change property. And we, have, uh, we can successfully identify the color direction. And if you have many variables, you can identify the whole deck. I make use of this result together with the previous one. Now let's go further. What if we have uh, parametric constraints on the color influence and we also have latent confounders? So in this case, you can see we can get some stronger results. For instance, with overcomplete independent component analysis based method, we can recover the uh, latent confounders. And on some further condition, we can also recover the color influences over the measured variables. And unfortunately, those, those methods assume that the latent confounders are mutually independent. In many cases, latent confounders may be related, right? Let's just consider uh, mental conditions, right? With the questionnaires, we try to infer the mental conditions and the mental conditions may be related. So we have to go further to recover everything in the relations among the latent variables. Uh, Silver, Ricardo, Peter, Clark, and um, Richard basically have been using the vanishing tetrad conditions to recover the latent variables and their relations. This structural constraint is generally pretty uh, strong because we have to assume that for each latent variable, there are at least three pure measured variables as indicators. And uh, uh, furthermore, with this method, essentially we can only recover the equivalent class of the color model over the latent variables. So it's not fully identifiable. Now let's see how we can further benefit from the non-Gaussian assumption on the, uh, on the knowledge term. So suppose in this color model right here, you can see Li variables are latent variables. They are color related. We observe Xi variables. Now we try to analyze the measured variables Xi's to recover the latent variables Li. What can we do? So right here, uh, first of all, we assume the knowledge terms are non-Gaussian. Of course, the relationship in this case are still assumed to be Gaussian. Uh, we try to benefit from this constraint. And then we can show that this whole color model, including latent variables and their relations, can be immediately identified by making use of the so-called generalized independent noise condition. And here by or gene condition, by gene condition, I mean the following thing. Suppose we have two subsets of the measured variables, the Y and Z. We say the ordered pair Y, Z satisfy the gene condition if and only if there exists a non-zero combina linear combination of the Y variables that is independent from Z. Now you can see, we can immediately test for this condition given the two sets of variables Y and Z. 
And furthermore, this condition has some very nice uh, graphical interpretation. Essentially, if the YZ satisfy gene condition, we know that there exists an exogenous set of the parents, latent parents of the Y variables that can give separate Y from Z. By making use of this graphical interpretation, then we can recover the whole structure in two steps. Uh, some situations we can have three steps. So step one is to find the color clusters. Here by cluster, I mean a group of random var male variables that share the same latent parents. So here we can find the clusters and then we can also find the causal orders of the latent variables. And furthermore, if needed, you can estimate those linear coefficients. So the whole color model is identifiable by making use of this uh, easily testable condition called the gene condition. Okay, now let's go further. Uh, here you can see some quick experimental results. So we analyze the teacher's burnout data with this method. Uh, in this data set, there are 28 measured variables and we recovered all those latent variables as you can see from here. And we found that the recovered model together with the color order of the uh, latent variables are consistent with the hypothetical, uh, hypothesized model by experts. So it's very nice because you can really recover the latent variables and their relations in this case. You can go further. Now you can see, we can even recover this latent hierarchical structure from the measured variables, only X eyes. Why? This is because uh, essentially the linear color inferences are transitive. Uh, in this case, consider this, this example. First of all, we can analyze the measured variables and then we can find the, those hidden variables. And then we can consider the measured variable as a surrogate for the uh, latent variable. And then we can go to a higher level. Eventually, all color variables, the latent color variables here, together with their relations will be identifiable in this case. So the procedure is rather simple. Of course, here we have to, in this work, we just constrain the relation linear. And furthermore, you can see minimality has to be assumed. Essentially, here by minimality, I mean edge minimality. And mean uh, edge minimality is uh, one kind of um, independent chain uh, condition. So now let me just show some uh, purely theoretical results. We can even find the necessary and sufficient condition on the structure so that it's identifiable from measured data. Uh, here on the right, you can see all identifiable causal structures uh, if you have three measured variables, x, one, two, three, right here. And again, we make use of uh, minimality. And the, although the theory is very nice, uh, given a graph, you can quickly check whether this uh, structure is identifiable involving the latent, ver latent variables uh, from measured data. However, uh, so far, there does not exist any efficient procedure to estimate the structure in the general case. So this is a purely theoretical result. However, you can see we can really benefit from edge minimality in order to recover latent variables and their relations. Now let's go to a different setting. Um, suppose we don't have ID data now. So he says we have no ID data. And by no ID data, I mean two different kinds of data. One is uh, uh, time series, data, traditional time series data. Essentially, we have data generated by a fixed time delayed causal model. Right here, we would like to estimate the uh, time delayed causal model from uh, metadata. In the first, let's consider a situation without latent components. And if there are no instantaneous relations, then you can use Granny causality to recover the time delayed causal relation. Essentially, Granny causality or Granny causal analysis can be considered as a way to combine conditional independent based method uh, together with the temporal constraints that um, future cannot cause the, uh, the past. Furthermore, you can even allow the instantaneous causal relations by, if you don't have the parametric con conditions, then still you can make use of a conditional independent based method. Actually, Granger made use of this method to uh, see the instantaneous relations among the measured variables. And furthermore, if you assume linear relations or linear, uh, linear Nagoshi model, then everything is identifiable, including time delayed and instantaneous relations. So we can benefit from parameter uh, constraints in this case as well. Now let's go further. Uh, so this is pretty messy. I just would like to summarize one work with one slide. So right here, you can see the setting, we just measure variables, x, i's. We always, I always use x, i's as measured variables. And we assume the measured variables were generated by an invertible nonlinear transformation, g, applied to some hidden variables, z. 
we would like to recover Z and their relations, right? So in this work, let's assume that latent processes follow a temporal column model with, for instance, a completed non parametric model. So now in this case, even if the temporal column model is completely non parametric in a general situation, ZI variables, the latent processes are identifiable from the time series data, XI. Why? This is because we can benefit from the time delayed causal relations. And furthermore, if you have non-stationarity in the noise or non-stationarity in the causal inference, you can further improve the result. And of course, if you have primary constraints, generally speaking, we can further improve, improve the results. Uh, so the estimation procedure may be statistically more efficient. Why do we have this, this, uh, this result? So here, let me try to give the intuition. Right here, you can see this is uh, essentially the latent uh, processes. Each latent variable was produced by the previous ones, right? And given the previous ones, the latent variable, latent process that would be conditionally independent because in this work, there are no instantaneous relationship between the latent processes. And then if you have a nonlinear transformation on the latent variables, then generally speaking, you are going to introduce a dependence, instantaneous dependence between the latent variables. As a consequence, we know that, oh, only the true one can satisfy the conditional independent relationship between the latent processes given their past values. Okay, so that's why the whole process of the, all the latent processes are actually identifiable. Uh, I will skip the experimental results. If you are interested, please have a look at the uh, papers so you can see uh, the results on simulated data and on real data. Basically, you can take video data as input, then you can analyze, you can recover some interesting latent processes. Okay, now uh, let's go further. In this case, we have previously, we have time delayed correlations. Now, suppose we have instantaneous correlations and we have independent, but not identically distributed data. What does that mean? So you may have multi-domain data, right? Within domain, the data basically uh, would be ID. However, the distribution can be different across different domains. Or you can have time series data, but the, the sample would be independent over time. However, the distribution may change over time, right? So this is known as independent, but not identically distributed data. In this case, we would like to estimate the instantaneous causal relations from such data. First of all, uh, it's clear that we can directly benefit from the distribution changes. And by enforcing the minimal and the independent changes of the color model, in many cases, we can recover the underlying true color model uniquely. And uh, even if they, we don't have any parametrical constraints, and here you can see, I use this color for uh, latent component. We allow a specific type of latent component known as the solo components. So if the solo comp if the components can be written as a function of uh, surrogate like domain index or time index, then we can allow such components. We can still get the right result, uh, even if we have such components. And furthermore, if you have parametric assumptions, the so linearity assumptions, then uh, you can develop statistically more efficient approaches uh, to recovering the underlying color model from data. Okay. So specifically in this work, you can see uh, what tasks we are going to uh, uh, deal with. First of all, from such data, non-stationary or heterogeneous data, we can immediately determine which color modules change over time across domains, as you can see from here. And furthermore, we can find the right color skeleton. And then by making use of independent change principle, uh, basically by that I mean the distribution of the cause and the dis conditional distribution of the effect given the cause would change independently. Then we can find the color direction. Note that this property of independent changes includes invariant mechanisms and the invariant causes as special cases because a constant is independent from everything. So we can find the direction. And uh, if needed, you can also find a low dimensional, real, uh, low dimensional representation of the change in the causal mechanism by making use of uh, some kernel trick. Essentially, you can find a non parametric way to reduce the dimensionality of the changes. Okay, so uh, if you would like to see some results, please have a look at the paper. This is uh, that setting. Now, let's go further. So in the, in the previous setting, we didn't allow genuine latent compounders, we only allow the specific type of compounders that can be written as functions of the surrogate variable. Now, uh, suppose we have latent compounders, a very simple way is to 
find the latent components by making use of nonlinear ICA. So this is a setting of nonlinear ICA or nonlinear independent component analysis. So they observe the variables the XI follow this model. So they, they are a nonlinear transform, invertible nonlinear transformation of the uh, latent variable ZI. Those latent variable ZI are mutually independent. We know that the solution to nonlinear ICA are highly non-unique. Uh, basically, there will exist an infinite number of solutions to uh, nonlinear ICA in the traditional setting. However, if you allow the distributions of the independent variable ZI to change across domains, then generally, ZI, the latent variables, can be recovered from the measured variables. Why? Basically, here I try to give the intuition with this uh, graphical illustration. Here, you can see those variables, ZI variables are conditionally independent given the uh, surrogate variables. You can see the think of theta i, theta one, theta two as some underlying texture to change the distribution of the independent variables, right? So given those things, Z1, Z2 are independent within, within domain, within each domain or for each distribution, the values of theta one, theta two are fixed. Now, G is a fixed function. So G transforms the ZI variable to the XI variables. And we would like to recover ZI variables from XI variables, right? Now you can see ZI are conditionally independent in each domain, because here we don't have the link between them. However, if you apply a nonlinear transformation to ZI, then unfortunately you are going to introduce uh, the additional spirit dependency between ZI variables. So again, this is something like a minimality uh, condition. With the wrong solution, you are going to you, you are going to introduce additional dependency between the uh, the latent variables. That means by enforcing the conditional independent relations between the latent variables within uh, across different domains, then we can recover them up to the component-wise transformations. And clearly, the i variables are confounded for x i variables, right? Okay, so here you can see in this setting, we can recover the independent underlying confounders. Let's go further. Now, suppose the measured variables follow uh, the same model, but the components of the latent variables, the uh, component of Z as latent variables are causally related. And some causal relations are assumed to change over time. First of all, if the causal relations over the latent variables are fixed, then we cannot recover the latent variables and their causal relation. Why? Because in this case, we can always write down um, the generating process for X uh, this way. Xi, the measured variables can always be considered as a nonlinear transformation of independent variables in this case, as long as the causal model over the latent variable is fixed. What if some of the causal relations change over time across different domains? Here you can see basically illustration. Uh, this is suppose this is the true process. We have z1, z2, z3, z4. You can see a causal model for illustrative purposes. And here by theta, I mean this causal relationship from z1 to z2 is fixed. The causal inference from z2, z3 to z4 is also fixed. However, the causal inference from z2 to z3 may change. And here by change, I mean there are two ways to change the causal inference. You can have the change in the causal influence from Z2 to 3, or you can have the ch uh, change in the causal level, in the uh, noise variable in Z3. First of all, we can reduce this mixing procedure to a canonical one. Here you can see, basically, we can just replace the latent variable that does not involve, uh, that is not involved in any change in causal relationship with the uh, independent variable. As you can see from here, we use Z1 and uh, E1 and E4, which are mutually independent to replace Z1 and Z4. This is always the case. However, for this part, we cannot reduce them to independent variables. Meaning that if you apply nonlinear ICA, you cannot recover Z2 and Z3 at all. Now we can show two, two uh, results. First of all, we can show that the invariant part, those Z E variables can be recovered up to its subspace. That means, they recover the E variables will not receive any contribution from the Z, I, Z variables, which are involved in a changing causal relationship. And furthermore, all those relationships involved in the changing causal relations, Z I variables can also be identified up to a subspace. So each recovered Z variable uh, involved in the changing causal relationship would be a function of Z2 and Z3. And furthermore, if you make some further assumptions, 
For instance, if you assume that the column model is linear Gaussian, then we can show that Z2 can also be recovered from Xi variables. And unfortunately, we cannot recover Z3 because any mixture of Z2 and Z3 would also uh, basically do the same work. Without the further sparsity constraints, we cannot recover these three variables. However, we can recover the causes of the uh, variable on which the causal inference change. Okay, so basically this is purely theoretical. And uh, to summarize, this talk is about the causal representation learning. Essentially, we like to see two things. First of all, what properties of causal system can we make use of uh, to recover the underlying causal representation? Second of all, how can we establish the identifiability result to make sure that what can, what, what it can recover from data is uh, consistent with the ground truth. So we just saw what information we made use of and uh, the identifiability result. And here I cover two levels of changes. You can have changes in value measured variables, or you can have changes in hidden variables or hidden parameters. And the uh, very rough or tell message is that follows. The latent variables, latent causal variables, and their relations involved in changing causal relations are generally identifiable. If, they are, if the causal relations over the latent variable do not change, then generally speaking, we cannot recover those variables. We have just consider them as a background. However, if they are involved in the changing causal relations, then we can just locate and recover those uh, variables together with the causal inferences. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's all for this talk. Uh, by the way, I would like to, uh, to uh, thank my collaborators, including Clark, Peter, Bernard, Apple, BW, and Wiran, and uh, uh, Sean. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will keep questions for afterwards in the panel discussion, because I think there will be a lot of questions of how this causal representation learning framework that was just discussed now by Kuhn and how that relates to the coarsening um, that Frederick uh, described before, in particular when you're in the setting that Kuhn had at the, at the end, right, mainly where you don't have any edges pointing from observed months to later ones. Um, so I think we'll keep that discussion for later on in the panel discussion. Kuhn, I hope you'll be able to join. Great. I will. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, and so then we'll have a break now. Um, we'll get some nice uh, coffee outside and some discussions, and then we'll be back here at uh, 11.